today is the final part in our eight part series, Acts Then and Now. And over the past seven weeks, we've looked at the issues of guidance, of Pentecost, of healing, of family, of purity and holiness, of being led by the Holy Spirit and not judging. This final part today looks at how God has the power to deliver us from bondage. For Peter, in the story we're going to look at, it was a physical prison secured by guards and metal bars and all other kinds of things they had in those days. For us, our prison may be different. It may be a difficult marriage. It may be an addiction. It may be financial worries. It may be health concerns. Some years ago, as I was thinking back and I was preparing this, uh, and this is before I was married um, to, to Joy, uh, I was out for a drink with Joy. We were going out at the time and uh, we went to a pub that was close to where she lived in Ramsgate and a friend of mine uh, was with us. And whilst we were drinking in this local pub, I had a, a phone call from my sister, who's also called Joy. Um, and uh, my sister said that my other sister, Anne, uh, was trapped in my mum's uh, ensuite. My mum was away somewhere on holiday or something. Uh, and Anne had got trapped in the ensuite bathroom. The lock had jammed and she was unable uh, to get out. And I had to come uh, and rescue her. Now, uh, it, it was a, a, a big thing. This was Big Brother going to the rescue. And I was, I was excited about that. Trouble was, I was 15 miles away uh, from where my sister was in this pub in Ramsgate. Uh, and so this was uh, time for a heavy right foot. Uh, at those times, I had a right foot to drive. And <laughs> now it's slightly different. Uh, but I drove those 15 miles from Ramsgate back to Deal, where our house was. Uh, rather quickly. I won't tell you how quickly. Um, I may have uh, fractured a few speeding laws in the process. Um, and I managed to borrow a, a ladder from our neighbours uh, and climbed up uh, the ladder and got through uh, the small window uh, into my mum's ensuite bathroom. And sure enough, uh, the lock was indeed jammed and my sister had been unable to get out. I think she was in there having a shower or something. Um, but fortunately, due to my uh, muscular physique and rippling torso, uh, I was able to ram uh, the bathroom door with my shoulder and a few hefty kicks in the right place. And uh, the door gave way or the bolt gave way and the door gave way. Unfortunately, the frame of the door gave way as well. The wood split um, and the door flew open and my sister was able to be uh, freed from the bathroom uh, unharmed. The door and the frame, on the other hand, were not so uh, fortunate. That was the closest I've ever come to being part of deliverance ministry. Um, but our Heavenly Father specialises in deliverance. Through Jesus' death on the cross and subsequent resurrection and the Holy Spirit's power, they are experts in freeing people from the bondage that sin uh, can create, from the prisons that the enemy would keep us in, keep us locked up in, to prevent us being who God has called us to be. So let's dive into the passage of scripture this morning, Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 19. It's a great story uh, of how Peter is freed from prison, Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 19. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he'd arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garments and follow me. So he went out and followed him. 
and he didn't know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognised Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's an angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to him with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. There were several Herods uh, at different times uh, through the scriptures, through the New Testament uh, scriptures. Now, when Jesus was born, it was Herod Antipas who was son of of Herod the Great and that's who we read of when Herod the wise men go and see uh, Herod and, uh, and and Herod wants to go and kill him and he instructs that all the baby boys under the age of two are killed that's Herod Antipas son of Herod the Great but Herod the Great also had another son uh, Aristobulus who had a son called Herod Agrippa the first and this account today refers to Herod Agrippa the first there was incidentally Herod Agrippa the second that followed him and Herod Agrippa I ruled Palestine from AD 41 until AD 44. And this Herod stirs up trouble uh, with the church to make himself popular uh, with the Jewish people. And he has James, the brother of John, uh, executed. Now, this was a big shock to the church. The church has seen some amazing uh, moves of God, some amazing power being displayed, the church growing in number, some amazing miracles happen, uh, as well as some difficult and challenging situations. Remember uh, Stephen, who was uh, stoned. Um, he was just one person who was martyred for his faith in those days of the early church. But James was the first apostle or the first disciple to be executed. And this sent uh, a shockwave, I think, through the church. The church uh, were, were shocked when one of Jesus' own disciples were executed. But interestingly, Jesus never promised that just because uh, the twelve were his disciples, his apostles, that necessarily they would be exempt uh, from persecution and from some hideous deaths. And so uh, so James is, is uh, executed uh, and the church are reeling from this. And at the same time, uh, Herod Antipas I has Peter uh, arrested as well. Now, having, le having divinely escaped from prison uh, before in Acts chapter 5, and you can go and read about that, this time Herod instructs Peter to be guarded by four squads of soldiers to make 100% sure that he doesn't escape. And Peter is almost certainly going to be executed by Herod, but God has other plans. Verse 6 tells us uh, in this passage we read that this night before, Herod, uh, before Peter's about to be brought out um, by Herod, Peter is sleeping, chained between these guards. Now, why is Peter sleeping? Because if that was me, the last thing I would want to be do is sleeping. I'm, I'm arrested, I'm in prison, I'm in chained between two guards, which is not a particularly comfortable place to be. Uh, and yet Peter finds himself... Uh, sleeping. Why? Because of complete trust in God? Yes, but also uh, because of what verse 5 says. 
constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. You see, the power of prayer brought peace to Peter's heart and mind so that he could rest. Even when Satan seeks to destroy, God provides peace. You know, Peter was in prison. The church couldn't do much about that apart from pray. And actually, prayer was the most powerful thing they could do because in one sense, prayer kept them safe, but prayer stormed the gates of heaven. Prayer unlocked God's power to come and intervene on Peter's behalf. And where mankind couldn't go, the men, the women, the disciples, the church couldn't get to Peter, there were no restrictions for God to get to Peter. Prayer moves things. Prayer changes situations. Acts chapter 12 verse 7 says, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by Peter and a light shone in the prison and he struck him on the side and raised him up. Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. You know, the power of God is such that the most secure places on earth are no match for the angelic army gaining access. And chains are no match for the power of of God. Now what did the soldiers see? I often wonder this. Peter is struck on the side by an angel. He's told to get up, put his cloak, wrap his cloak around him uh, quickly and his chains fell off. He's, Peter's chained to two soldiers. So what do these two soldiers see? Do, do they see anything? Were they like frozen in time for this miraculous act? We don't know. We're not told. But what we are told is that Peter is escorted past the guards outside his cell, past the next set of guards, and he stands, finds himself standing before the iron gate that leads to the city. And this gate swings open of its own accord. Was it not locked? Not a chance. This lock gate would have been locked and secured. This was God's power removing man-made obstacles that get in the way of God's purposes. Now, Peter, whilst all this is going on, happens to think it's a vision and that would be a reasonable thing for him to think. And it's not until he's been led by the angel down one street that the angel suddenly leaves him and he comes to his senses. And he says in verse 11, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Now, where does Peter go in this situation? Where would you go if you've been uh, released from prison? He goes to the church, to the Christian believers. Um, you know, we, well, obviously we weren't there back then, um, but my sense is that today, whereas there were lots of churches and we gather all over the place in church buildings and in homes and in rented halls and stuff, back then when we talk about the church in Corinth or the church in Rome or the church in Thessalonica, there, there was uh, one church in that place as we understand it. There wasn't lots of different buildings. Uh, there was one church, one place. They often met in different homes, but they would come together um, in uh, one place. So Peter goes to this church, to the Christian believers, and he knocks on the door and they happen to be meeting in uh, the house. And inside the house, inside this church, um, the people are praying for Peter and they're unaware of his release they're just they're just praying that God will release him that will protect him uh, meanwhile Peter's outside and he's knocking on the door and so the servant girl goes to the door and instead of opening the door she hears Peter's voice instead of opening the door she is so excited that she runs and tells the people that are praying that Peter's standing outside they respond in disbelief but eventually they go and open the door and they find that Peter's standing there no doubt with a sore hand after all the knocking and Peter then tells his story which is his testimony of what God has done and his testimony encourages uh, the church he tells them how this angel has appeared and has freed him from prison and they're overjoyed and overwhelmed and that testimony encourages the people just like our testimonies today encourage us as the church and he then tells them to go and tell James. Now, this James is not the James has just been executed. This is James, the brother of Jesus, before Peter then departs for another place. Now, the Bible tells us that in the morning, Herod is really ticked off. His prize prisoner uh, has escaped again. Peter was due for death uh, and the guards who've lost, in inverted commas, 
uh, Peter are executed uh, in his place, as was customary. And I always kind of feel sorry for the guards because, you know, they were just following orders uh, and standing there. They may not even have agreed uh, with uh, Peter's arrest. They probably didn't say that, but they may not have agreed. And yet they're the ones that find that uh, they're being executed and Peter's uh, gone free. And I often wonder uh, what the guards think about that. God, God's miraculous power saving Peter doesn't save the guards. But um, that's something we're not really told any more about. So how does this kind of apply today, this story? Well, if today we think that we cannot be locked up um, in this country because of our Christian witness, then we're quite wrong. Maybe we can't so easily get locked up in a physical prison, a physical jail, but Satan can very easily uh, lock us up um, and use methods to lock us up and prevent us from being effective uh, Christians who God has called us to be. At the end of February, beginning of March, I preached a two part series on uh, the power of forgiveness, which I know was very helpful for people because you see unforgiveness can be one thing, one prison that Satan uses to hold us up in, harboring anger and fear and guilt and hate and slander against other people. They're hugely powerful prisons and that unforgiveness um, like I said back then, is is a like a cancer that will eat us up from inside and destroy us. Addictions are another kind of a prison. Addictions to alcohol, to pornography, to drugs, to food even, uh, overeating, gluttony, that kind of stuff. Gambling, self-image. You know, these things we use to blot out the real us or to hide from the real us or to hide painful experiences uh, that have happened to us in the past. These things have the potential to uh, physically imprison us as well and ultimately kill us in certain situations. But there's good news. God has the power to free us from those things, free us from those things. Peter, for Peter, it was, it was a physical prison with physical walls physical bars, physical locks and physical guards. For us, our issue may be physical, it may be mental, it may even be spiritual, but God has the power to break all such prisons just like he did with Peter. What he did then, he can do now. We may not be locked up in physical prisons, it may be some other kind of prison. We often call them strongholds, things that have a stronghold um, in our life. So how does God break these prisons or these strongholds in our life? Well, there's different ways. The first thing is through prayer. Prayer has to be the foundation to all the other things. Prayer has to be the foundation. And prayer may be the whole cure. We may ask God to help us, to heal us from whatever that addiction is, to free us from whatever that prison is. And, and it may just happen. God may miraculously just free us from that place. Maybe it's a physical thing. Maybe it's a mental thing. Maybe it's a spiritual thing. God may just free us from that place. But equally, God may also use other ways as well as prayer to free us from those things we struggle with, those prisons, those strongholds. And so the second thing, and these are in no particular order apart from number one being prayer, the second thing is removing the desire. Sometimes God will miraculously remove the desire to that sin, to that prison, to that thing that holds us captive um, and free us and help us to, to, to find that freedom and to be who God has called us to be. That may be, we may have a problem with, with overeating, for example. We may have an, uh, an, an issue with self-harm or self-image or something like that. And, and, and we use those things and we find ourselves addicted to those things to cover up the pain. And it's like we can't get free from that desire to eat or to, uh, to cover ourselves with tattoos or to, um, to, to, to change the way we look uh, or the way we dress or something, to draw attention to ourselves, to cover up the pain of what's going inside. And, and, and God may just work a miracle and remove that desire. One day there is a desire there to do that. One day there is not a desire to do that. We've just lost the desire and we break through it. Another way, the third way, uh, is through medical intervention. 
You see, sometimes God will use medical intervention to solve the problem or to help us overcome the issues we face. Unfortunately, people can be reticent to turn to medicine to help them with their problems. But you see, God has enabled uh, people to discover all kinds of medications that do all kinds of amazing things uh, to treat us. And we shouldn't be afraid to use those things, so long as they're not um, uh, Eastern mystic kind of treatments. There are some dodgy treatments out there. But the stuff that uh, the vast majority of stuff that you can get on the NHS um, and, uh, and and other things is 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 good to help us in that process. And God will use that medical intervention to bring uh, about that healing. Sometimes he uses that to bring healing. And lastly, uh, God uses counselling and or ministry. Sometimes the prisons we face can be because of past situations in our life that have left us scarred in some way. And so we need to ask other people to help us navigate the maze to find that freedom. Sometimes that can be counselling, talking through our problems. It's good to talk. Talking uh, helps with our problems. But also, and certainly for Christians, I believe, ministry is important. Sozo ministry, which is a word that um, talks about finding freedom and finding healing. Sozo ministry is amazing and I've had Sozo ministry to find healing from stuff in my life. It's a powerful tool uh, that really works and works effectively. There are just four ways that we can uh, find freedom and tools that God uses to help us find freedom from the prisons or the strongholds that we face. And as I say, apart from number one, they're in no particular order. God uses some or all of those uh, methods to help us find freedom. The prisons we find ourselves in are places that Satan wants to keep us locked up. But our Heavenly Father wants us to be free, free to live the life that he has destined for us. You see, Jesus paid the price for our sin when he died on the cross and then rose again so that we didn't have to be in bondage to sin. We didn't have to remain in bondage to those negative things that have happened to us in our life, those things that we put in place to cover up the pain of bad experiences in our past. But Satan will try and convince you to remain in those prisons because of Satan's sick mind. He tries to convince us that our problems and those prisons are actually places of comfort because we know what's going on. We can manage those things. And he turns those things around that, that torment us. And in a, in a weird and twisted way, it, we, we find a comfort in them. It's a bizarre thing that's hard to explain. But God will help you to find freedom and find a new purpose in life and a new destiny in life. He doesn't want you to remain in those prisons. Satan has this power, he thinks, to keep you in that place. But we know that God is all powerful. Phil Wickham wrote a worship song called This Is Amazing Grace that we sing. And it has such truth. Here are some of the words. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphans a son and daughter? the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. I hope that these past eight weeks have helped you in your Christian walk with Jesus. There is so much more in these stories and in the book of Acts that is relevant today. So go and read it for yourself. Be encouraged and be blessed. Lastly, F.F. F. Bruce relates the story of Sunder Singh, a Tibetan Christian who was likewise freed miraculously from a prison. For preaching of the gospel, he was thrown into a well and a cover set over it and securely locked. 
he would be left in that well until he died, and he could see the bones of rotting corpses of those who had already perished in there. On the third night of his imprisonment, he heard someone unlocking the cover of the well and removing it. A voice told him to take hold of a rope that was being lowered. Sundar was grateful that the rope had a loop and he could put his foot in because he'd injured his arm in the fall down into the well. He was raised up, the cover was replaced and locked. But when he looked to thank his rescuer, he could find no one. When morning came, he went back to the same place. He was arrested and started preaching again. News of the preaching came to the official who had arrested him and Sundar, who was brought before him again. When the official said someone must have gotten the key and released him, they searched for the key and they found it on the official's own belt. God is still writing the book of Acts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this miraculous story of how you freed Peter from prison. Father, we thank you that locks and guards and chains cannot keep us from your purposes. They cannot keep you out. Nothing on this earth is so powerful that it prevents you from reaching people. Nothing is so powerful that your angels cannot get to us at your command. Father, we thank you for that amazing story and the encouragement it brought to the church and the encouragement it's brought to the church over the centuries until today. Father, we just ask that you continue that miraculous work, the work that you're doing in the book of Acts, that you continue to do it today as you continue to write that book. Father, we just pray for those issues in our lives as we struggle with things that keep us prisoner. Maybe it's issue of unforgiveness, maybe it's financial issues, maybe it's sexual issues, maybe it's marriage issues, maybe it's work issues. Father, maybe it's something else, but thank you that you have the power to break those issues. Thank you that you use amazing ways to set us free, sometimes physical ways, sometimes things like counselling, sometimes medical intervention, sometimes just pure miracles like you did with Peter. But Father, thank you that you are a God who wants to set us free. And so I pray, Father, for anyone watching this and listening to this who has got a prison in their life, something that's holding them locked up, a stronghold, Father, I pray in Jesus' name right now that you will break that in Jesus' name, that you will break that thing. Father, you will work a miracle in people's lives. You will set people free from those things. Father, as I'm praying that chains will be falling off in the spiritual realm, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray you, pray you set people free physically and mentally in Jesus' name. Just bring miraculous healing so that people will have testimonies to share with the church, testimonies to share with family, testimonies to share with friends, testimonies to share with people who don't yet know you as Lord and Saviour, to show that you are real, that you are alive and that you are an all-powerful God. We just pray for your mighty blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.